Welcome and thank you for attending the Digital Management of Diabetes uh, Discovery Cafe session. We will have 75 minutes for our session today. Moderators will be equipped with iPads uh, to take questions the audience can submit via the mobile app. We're pleased to have record turnout at the forum today, and I'll be helping to keep us on time. It is my pleasure to introduce your moderator, Dr. Deborah Wexler. Hello, my name is Deborah Wexler. I am the clinical director of the MGH Diabetes Center and an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And I'm really excited to be here with this group of people today. Before we get started and have everyone introduce themselves, I'm just going to give a brief um, kind of overview so that we're all on the same page. Um, today, although the focus of this conference writ large is AI, we're going to talk here not only about AI, but all of the new technologies that have really changed the way we deliver diabetes care across the spectrum of care. But before we launch into that, I mean, just want to set a baseline understanding of what is diabetes, what is type 1 diabetes, what is type 2 diabetes, very briefly. So type 1 diabetes is what used to be called juvenile diabetes or insulin-dependent diabetes. It's about 5% of people with diabetes. And this is the condition in which antibody, uh, autoimmune attack on the beta cells of the pancreas cause the pancreas to stop making insulin. People with type 1 diabetes depend on insulin for life and need to monitor blood glucose frequently throughout the day and choose an appropriate insulin dose to manage the blood sugar levels. The vast majority of type 2 diabetes is type 2 diabetes, which is associated with the, epi with the obesity epidemic. And for people with type 2 diabetes, there's lots of um, things that people need to monitor. Blood glucose is one for some people, but not for all. Weight is very important, and the other comor comorbid conditions, such as hypertension, hyperlipidemia, cardiovascular disease, become much bigger features of self-management. So with that basic understanding, if people have questions as we go along, feel free to ask about that. Um, there's lots of other types of diabetes, but when we think about technology, the types of technological solutions may be different for different types of diabetes. So let me turn now to my panelists and have them introduce themselves. Marie? Yes, great. Thank, thanks, Deborah. I want to extend my thanks to you and to the organizers for inviting me today. I'm Marie McDonald, and I'm the director of, the, of a clinical program at Brigham and Women's uh, Hospital in Diabetes, which is a multi-site location for specialty-level diabetes care. I also oversee the general diabetes program in the hospital. Um, I guess what's important, I think, for me to introduce myself as also as a, as a clinician, mainly, um, who's been focused on healthcare delivery and healthcare delivery science for about 15 years, uh, starting in the hospital, but then as my career went on to transitioning from the hospital, from urgent care areas, and now in, in um, the ambulatory setting where uh, digital health has, be, has moved in is really a major part of what we do every day. Uh, and Four years ago, I started a, um, I went on a path with Partners Healthcare to deliver virtual care to patients with diabetes, focus on specialty areas like um, type 1 diabetes and more complex type 2 and other subtypes. Uh, so most of what I've done and what my con contribution will be in that sphere and in, um, in talking about virtual visits and, and telemedicine. My name is Michael Meissner. I'm the Chief Technology Officer and really on the fancy side, but really practically leading the uh, technology group at Sanofi for medical devices. Um, so I'm not a physician. I, I do have about 20 years of background in radiology. So it was interesting to see the virtual colonoscopy in the previous session downstairs. It's been 18 years in 2002 that we published a New England Journal of Medicine paper. How long it takes in, in, in medicine to actually impact practice and for it to become common practice, right? So I've been in, in pharma for the last five years, and, and we're looking at our insulin injection devices and others, how we can bring them with electronics and capabilities to enable others to leverage the data, but also for us to actually open up a new venture of how do we create value in this ecosystem where people have access to different data? How do we want to play in there? And, and how we allow connectivity of our data and other people's data? Um, I think two years ago, we went into the new world of medical devices, and you know, software as a medical device is new, and for pharma, company is very new, and so it's an interesting journey to see, and it's good to see that finally these devices in the hands of patients can make a difference. I think the opportunity here really is compared to radiology and pathology, where you only have the physician have access to the data, and they really make the diagnosis. Here we actually have a, a counterplay of the patients themselves and the physicians, and there might be a more consumer-driven environment that might accelerate faster, hopefully. 
So I'm Josh Riff. I am an ER doctor by background. Um, but today, I'm here as the CEO of a company called Onduo. Um, Onduo is a joint venture between Google, or Verily, and Sanofi. Um, what we do is we're trying to build a system to democratize the care for people with diabetes. And our vision is that anyone, anywhere, should be able to get access to the highest level of care. So we've built what we call a virtual specialty clinic for, on, for this group. Uh, in particular, it's a virtual diabetes clinic, and the idea is you could get remote coaching for lifestyle, monitoring, monitoring with a continuous glucose monitor, and then with telemedicine with access to an endocrinologist if needed. Um, when we're successful, a primary care doc is able to manage a patient uh, during visits and then between visits um, using the Ondua system. Our goal is to prevent what we call unnecessary clinical escalations. We believe that if you have diabetes and it's well controlled, you should never need an ER visit, um, a inpatient stay, or a brick and mortar endocrinology visit um, because your primary care doc should be able to manage it. Marie Schiller, good afternoon, everybody. Deborah, thank you for allowing me to be on the panel. I have been in the, the biotech industry here in Boston for over 25 years. Started at two startups, one out of MIT, and, and now have the, the luxury of being at the Cambridge Innovation Center, which is a newly opened innovation center for Eli Lilly, and spearheading a lot of our technology efforts, as Michael talked about his efforts. Um, we're doing a similar uh, set of uh, technology integration with our molecules in Cambridge. So thrilled to be leading the product uh, development activities. I wear a second hat that I often uh, talk about is my own journey with type 1 diabetes. So I was diagnosed when I was nine. That was in 1982 um, on, on Christmas Eve. I always say it's uh, not a good memory to bring back. But I'm uh, excited to have the opportunity to talk about how technology has already started to transform people's lives, but how much further we need to go because probably not a huge surprise to many of you when you introduce new tools into any markets, in particular healthcare, it opens up opportunities, but it also forces us to look at, at many aspects of what's already in place and to figure out how we need to change what's in place to adapt so we can really get the full potential out of the tools coming out. So excited to be able to talk about that today. Great. Okay. Well, this is, this is a great lineup. So we had an idea that we were going to go from sort of the narrow sort of patient level to the broad systems level. And we actually already have one question that came in on the app, which absolutely feeds into where I wanted to go. Please do put your questions into the app. But before I actually get to this app question, I'm going to ask, it's a question about how the new systems um, with automated insulin injection are going to work for type 2. Before we go to type 2, Marie, I'm wondering if you could tell us about the automated insulin delivery systems with type 1 how they're used in practice now, how they've changed your practice, and then we'll maybe take it to the group with a little more about how it might play out in the future with type 2 diabetes. Sure, great. So really what we're talking about is what a lot of folks call um, the bionic pancreas or artificial pancreas. Um, I think bionic pancreas is a more realistic term in the sense that this is we're really talking about automating insulin delivery and having it be a closed loop where the insulin delivery depends on the measured glucose, which is in the from the interstitium usually, well now, um, and, and there's a feedback loop, and, and if the accuracy is good enough, the, the insulin is delivered really without much input from the patient. So it's, um, what I will say is bef before the automated insulin delivery, continuous glucose monitoring was really the game changer for patients because especially when it eliminated the need to monitor glucose by blood capillary finger stick, which is a barrier for many patients uh, globally. But af once that was sort of settled in and, and we got comfortable with that CGM, continuous glucose monitoring, that's when we saw the bionic pancreas uh, journey begin. And, and right now, we aren't there yet. We don't have a full closed loop, but we do have devices that are clearly adept at making adjustments um, in insulin rates or delivery rates uh, based on blood glucose. Uh, I would say what we've learned is that not everybody can access these devices. Um, they're not appropriate for everyone. Right now, they require a ton more patient engagement than we probably expected before these devices came on the market. Um, and then the, thir the fourth thing I would learn, if there were fourth, fourth there, uh, is that um, our patients are, are giving us 
us and the technology and the companies that are building these tools the right feedback, that their feedback is critical. How are they incorporating in this into their lives? And you know, I, I, that's one thing I think we could get better at is getting more feedback from the patient, but um, it's, it's certainly, it's, it's really transformed the way we take care of diabetes. We're not totally there yet, but um, you know, the, the last thing I'll say is most of the data can be uploaded to the cloud, which then can be downloaded onto um, a server that um, is a secure server in our hospital systems, um, or on t depending on how we, we access the data. But I can access data for hundreds of patients at one time. And we invite patients onto those cloud-based um, uh, products so that we can uh, monitor them over time and, and make it easy for all of our clinicians because we do practice team-based care, to take care of the patients uh, together. I just want to pick up on that, and then we'll come back to the type 2 point. I think one of the challenges for clinicians, of course, is when you get all the data, but you, are, you, know, you basically are paid to see patients in the yes, clinic, that's right. it then becomes an enormous amount of information to manage and to communicate about. And I, I feel like, Josh, maybe you guys have a view on flipping that model and how that has played out. Yeah, so uh, you know, it's funny. We were talking about this a little bit earlier. Um, you know, it should be almost criminal to have somebody on insulin who's supposed to titrate and not be on titration software. Um, but for the clinician, and we've done a lot of these focus groups, it's so much easier for the clinician to press print, take a piece of paper and say, hey, titrate according to these guidelines and give it to the patient, versus a lot of these systems where they're going to have to log in periodically and update the patient and, and push things to the, to the patient. So what we've done is... Um, We've integrated with a couple of these titration systems, but we've said let's become a focus factory where it's part of somebody's job. All they do is help manage these titration systems. And so we, we've said to the clinician, the primary care doc, or even the endocrinologist, your job is to convince the patient to take the drug and to identify that it needs to be titrated. We could then outsource all of the care of the actual titration. Um, and so we believe, like you mentioned, doctors are really, really busy, and the more we could take off their plate, the better we're serving um, the patients. And are you using algorithms to do that, or are you still relying on a human to do that? No, al algorithms. Yeah. yeah. So we use, um, right now we, we use a couple different systems, depending on which health system we're working with, um, but there's a couple commercially developed ones, a couple pharma developed ones, and, and we'll use the right one for the right situation. Do, do either of you want to put comment on algorithms before? Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say you talk about where these technologies are targeted, and I think the basal titration is a good example of one. It's interesting when we think about where the first applications is as you first go on to basal insulin and trying to make sure that you can take something that was a paper-based algorithm and digitize it and, and provide some help. I think the question is, is when you look beyond those first you know, two to three months, we know the demands of insulin will change over time. Type 2 is a progressive disease. And so how do you focus on the millions of people who are on basal insulin today and they're only getting in to see the physician. The recommendation is three times a year, but we all know you call and you can't get the visit or you cancel and then it takes you three months to get. So they're going for months on end without potentially optimizing that dose. And I think there's a huge opportunity there through intermittent care or through telemedicine approaches that um, various uh, health systems are setting up. But I think being able to provide that, you know, whether it's daily support or meeting people where they are is going to be critical for all these systems as we move forward. The, the best analogy we came up with is it's just a Coumadin clinic. Like health systems got very comfortable sending their patients on Coumadin to this third-party clinic to manage their Coumadin levels with their INR. Um, exact same thing with insulin titration is where we think the world should get to. So one point I think that's really important to make, because Josh, you, you said something. You, you're trying to prevent the, inner, the unnecessary escalation of care. So we should think about our patients with diabetes. I like to think about a, a, a population pyramid that most of our patients are down at the bottom of the pyramid and in the middle are probably type 2 patients who need insulin. Mm -hmm. And then at the tippity top is where Deborah and I practice, where we have patients with more complex diabetes, so type 1, cystic fibrosis-related diabetes, mm -hmm. diabetes related to pregnancy or during pregnancy when they're, they're, they become pregnant in other forms um, where I think titration algorithms don't, they don't fit well. Um, but we, what we don't want, and, and I think we're all in agreement, that 
we would prefer to keep patients as low in the pyramid as possible if they can stay there because it's lower cost care. We're not spending excessive dollars on them, but they're also freer. They're in the community. They have access to their data and they know, oh, okay, I'm on one injection a day of insulin. It's been, it's been a while since I've gone up on this dose. Where should I be? Yeah. Um, so just wanted to clarify that for folks. I think that if we can be strong in the middle of the pyramid and at the top, patients stay where they should be. Yeah. You know? I just want to pick up on one point, even though I'm the moderator, I also participate in this world, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chime in from time to time. And I'm going to chime in, particularly with respect to the first question that came in, which is with type 2 diabetes being so big and prevalent, um, what are the basically opportunities and challenges with closed loop um, and automated insulin injection in terms of promising innovation? And I think one very interesting thing is that a lot of this algorithmic, it's not that algorithms couldn't be designed for diabetes and pregnancy or for type 1. But the variability is greater, and so it's a harder algorithm to create, and you need more rescue um, medicine. So for type 2 uh, diabetes with insulin titration and algorithms, the currently available systems on the market would work beautifully for type 2, because type 2 is just much easier to control. So absolutely, you could use those systems right now. <coughs> Am I the last one? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that probably the whole panel would agree with is a lot of our focus is the right care at the right location at the right time. And so in my previous, you know, careers, um, we've worked on, you know, what is the appropriate license for care? And sometimes it's no license, sometimes it's a pharmacist, other times it's an NP or PA, et cetera, et cetera. So we are really successful with retail clinics building these little doctor's offices in Targets or Walmarts because, you know, strep throat care is really simple. You don't need an MD um, to take care of somebody's strep throat. Um, type 2 diabetes isn't necessarily complex. It's just really time consuming. And when we interview primary care docs, um, their reason for referral to an endocrinologist is very rarely it's too complex for me or I don't understand the drugs. It's I don't have a certified diabetes educator. I don't have dedicated support to sit down with the patient and talk to them for 30 to 45 minutes about how to take insulin, about lifestyle management, et cetera. So I send them to a focus factory, and, and not because um, Marie's not a brilliant clinician, but Marie has all the resources to help care yeah, for yeah. that patient. That's true. There's another item, right? How do we bring that care down, down the food chain, right? The, the $40,000 a year, I think New York Times had that three years ago, right, for a T1 patient. That's not the cost profile for a T2 patient, right? So when we leave patients in the pyramid where they are, how do we bring these devices and the technologies down? Because, you know, they're very complicated. I think there's lots of videos on how the human factors of these pumps are not made for, for, for basic users. And the question is like, what's the right level of intervention at the right level of the pyramid? And we probably haven't yet found the right solutions to get us there across the broad base. But I think we're getting into the diabetes 2.0 digital area where now with CGMs and on, a lot of stuff becomes available more ubiquitously and can innovate in that space. But I think that's probably what prevented us in the past, that yeah. the care was here and in between there's not a lot, but the opportunity is yeah, well. think, yeah, I mean, type 2 is progressive, right? So as you mentioned, there are unfortunately people with type 2 that end up in a very similar space as type 1s, right? And I so I think we always think about it as, you know, sort of meeting people where they are. I do think the closed loop for certain individuals, whether they have type 1 or type 2, will be the right approach. It's just impossible for them to get care any other way. And actually with CGMs and others, we can probably identify those individuals that we know need variable basal rates, right? Not going to be a lot of people with type 2, but some people with type 2. So I think the diagnostics and our ability to do that assessment will really help us identify. And frankly, there's probably some people with type 1s that don't need to be on the closed loop, right? That will do just fine on connected pen technologies and other solutions that we're coming out with. So I think it's going to be a time that we'll start to see this personalization of the approaches as uh, we learn more about individuals. Yep, so I want to pick up on CGM um, yeah. for a couple reasons. We had a question from the audience about CGM. 
um, asking whether CGM will improve outcomes as, and also you know, be the foundation of AI. But I also think CGM is a technology that really exemplifies all of this. It's new to market. It, of course, seemed like it was going to be for type ones. Now with the Libre, we see it being used widely and people really wanting this technology. It's still expensive. So you know, there's a lot of ways it can be used. How do people see it fitting into what they do in, in various patient contexts and programs? Yeah. So I, I could start because we've, we've built a program that's heavily based on continuous glucose monitors for people with type 2 diabetes. We need a better name for it, but we call it intermittent continuous glucose monitoring. <laughs> Um, so what we're learning is we're deploying um, CGMs. Uh, we have partnered with Dexcom on this one, and we're deploying it to people who have type 2 diabetes. And what we're trying to do is build the algorithms to ask what is the minimum frequency that somebody needs to wear a continuous glucose monitor to get the maximal be uh, you know, glycemic benefit. Um, and this is really fascinating. Um, we've deployed it to hundreds of people. The vast majority of people we've deployed it to had never heard of a CGM before. So that, that's the first one. So you have people who are either on orals, some of them are on injectables, but they had never heard of a continuous glucose monitor. They accepted it from a coach, somebody that they had a digital relationship with they never met in person, and then we shipped it to their home, um, and 86% of people put it on at home. Um, and that's with no clinician help, no CD help, no video support. They just put it on at home. Um, and then the most fascinating feature of that um, is the vast majority of people said that wearing a continuous glucose monitor helps them manage their diabetes on the continuous glucose monitor, but more importantly, manage it after they stop wearing it. Um, and the reason why is unless you're, unless you're dosing your insulin and replacing your finger strip with a continuous glucose monitor, the traditional establishment thinks there's no point in wearing it. Um, but we find users wear it, and they all discover two or three triggers for when they go out of range. Um, so the vast majority of people will identify a way that um, exercise or a certain food um, will take them in range or out of range. And so we have great stories um, of people who you know, didn't know that you know, breakfast cereal really sends them into the three, 400 range, and then they adjust their diet and they stop eating breakfast cereal because for years you could tell somebody, don't eat breakfast cereal, don't eat breakfast cereal, but until they actually see it. Um, and the, the interesting thing is even um, uh, people without diabetes, like I wore one and I fly um, a certain airline that gives you those purple healthy chips, and I always thought they were healthy chips, um, <laughs> but they're not. Like for me, they're super glycemic for me. Um, and so the, the, for we use continuous glucose monitors probably 20% for clinical acceleration, but 80% is what we call a reason to believe. So you give somebody who says, I have diabetes, I take these meds, I don't know, I go in every 90 days and they tell me what my A1C is, it, I, I don't, it, it doesn't really it mean doesn't a mean lot anything. to me. Mm -hmm. But when you actually show them something and they're watching it and they drink a dark beer versus a light beer, and they're like, wow, ma major difference for me, and that they are able to control their diabetes for the first time. Yeah, and the graphic interface is a huge part of that. Not everybody, yeah. this is a tech savvy crowd, but a lot of people really don't think in numbers yeah. the way they think in pictures, and I think that's a big yeah, piece of it. Yeah, and, and so it's, it's funny you say that. Like, we've even been playing with color zones, and you grow a flower the more time that you're <laughs> in range or your garden blossoms, but people just want the directional input. They don't care that I'm a 98 versus 107. So, the, oh, go ahead. I, I, I love what you said, and, and the item is just like, the CGM is really just an enabler data. The question is how we turn that into something meaningful, right? The ones who have an iPhone, I don't know about Android, where they have it, but it now tells you how much time you spend on your phone. The first time you look at it, you go like, oh. holy cow, right? <laughs> so seeing data actually tells us something, and then we have a choice to react. I think seeing the same data plus minus every week again mm -hmm. doesn't mean anything, right? So the question is like, I think, Josh, what you guys are doing, how do I take now the CGM data and bring it in context and help nudge people somewhere, right? Yeah. Because a CGM by itself is a, is a moment in time that has an opportunity. Taking that opportunity and growing into something more takes interventions, takes soft skill, and takes design of how we touch a patient, right? And T1, T2, younger or older respond very differently. So now we get into these, what are these services that we give to patients? And it's no longer one size fits all. It becomes very complicated of how we actually leverage this and translate it into it, and it's not easy to translate, right? Yeah. Michael, I can tell you I was sharing a story with Marie. Dexcom came out with a software update over the weekend, and now for the first time they have something called Glucose Management Index, which is an estimation of your HbA1c. So you're looking at your summary, and all of a sudden you can see your HbA1c, which is really the score that many of us in diabetes always the love-hate with it, mostly hate. 
Um, but my Thank screen time went up 34% the first week the feature <laughs> was on. So I looked yesterday, I said, wow, 34% increase, because you do. You start looking at how many days I can hit you know, my time and range and other aspects, which again is good and bad, right? It's good and bad, and it's, that is a really it, important point yeah, about this technology. It's, it's really what important. is A lot of what I've seen yeah. in the diabetes technology space is actually not that user-centered. Yeah. It's either hard to use, requires yeah. input from people, or doesn't really use what we know about human psychology to make the technology yeah. work for people. Yeah, and we'll tell you the T1D exchange data that Dr. Beck presented at ATTD. Josh, while you're seeing some of those examples, again, albeit in an adult type two population, that was a primarily adolescent population. They did not see improvements right. in HbA1c even though they've seen a significant increase in CGM use. So all of us who are loving these technologies and seeing it, you're staring at this data and saying, why isn't it getting there? And, and one of the reasons better? is because you don't, you've, you've now got, so for type one in particular, I think people have the data, but there's yeah. not a lot you can do to fix it different from what you did before. Well, right. you know, you're type two who was eating the bagel, okay, it's easy to cut out that bagel. Right. Yeah. The type one who's still using the same technologies he or yeah. she has always yeah. used, now they have more data, and it is there's, helpful, but the, the there's way, a limit. Yeah. The way to think about it, though, is I, they have very different purposes for different populations. Yes. If you have type 1 and your life depends on taking the right dose of insulin, you have to either prick your finger or you could use a continuous glucose monitor, and your acceptance of a continuous glucose monitor is me weighing the benefit of wearing something versus pricking four to eight times a day. That's a simple user value yes. proposition. Yep. On the type two space, it's very different because they don't have to finger stick necessarily. So we have to give them a different value prop. And if you guys are in healthcare, my guess is at some point or other, someone's giving you a free Fitbit or something in some program. And the majority of people just wear it and you wear it for a couple weeks, you see your numbers and you don't do anything. The smart companies that leverage these wearables have created challenges where you challenge your spouses, your family, coworkers, and that's where you start to see behavioral change. It's not just having the data. And I think that's a key, key um, thing that we have to teach industry, um, especially on the West Coast. Silicon Valley thinks, oh, if I could just unlock data, we're gonna change everyone's behavior. It's not. Data is just data until it's contextualized with some human um, yeah. behavioral economics or behavioral, behavioral factors. Insight, yeah. I just yeah. want to add one quick perspective, which Deb knows well. So just like five years ago, this data wasn't really real time. So the reason why mm. Joshua can, and Nduo can do this work is because the industry for CGM has advanced to the point where it really is real time. When I first, we first started using CGM, we had to teach patients that there was a lag time, that in fact, mm. You know, the number you see on the CGM is really not your actual glucose value. You're going to learn from where it goes and where it was. And there were arrows. There's still arrows. But the point I'm making is some of you might be wondering, well, why aren't we moving faster? Why doesn't everybody have a CGM? And it's in part because we don't have to teach patients that anymore. It's that, gotten That we are now at yeah. the point where it replaces the finger stick. And that's new. That's really just the past three years. So mm -hmm. um, it's time. But uh, the time is, is now. Yeah. I don't think we, we're there so, so, yet. So just to pick up on that, one of the questions that um, has come in is when can this um, be used, when can this data be used to change the course of how diabetes is managed? And I mean, I, have, I don't know if you want to, yes, or Michael. Yeah. Like any time. <laughs> so we, I mean, it's, it's a lot of it is, I mean, we're deploying it today. Um, the challenge, and Michael kind of mentioned it earlier, is healthcare just moves really slowly. So um, CGMs are technically today reimbursed by insurance for people who are type 1 or type 2 insulin dependent finger sticking at least four times a day. Because what they did is we did the math, right. an actuary did the math and said, okay, four strips, you lose a couple meters, et cetera, et cetera, and then weigh that against the cost of CGM, and they said that's the only group we're going to cover it for. Although that's really Medicare and Medicaid. Yeah, well, some, almost, of that's, 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 some of the private ones, they don't care. Uh, they some. care. So we they have, don't care. Yeah. So the majority will they have care, some but they're not going to look into it yeah. against CGM for everyone. We believe in CGM, everyone intermittently. Um, so for us, I mean, we're deploying it today, but the way we do it is we bundle it into a package oh. so you don't get billed for the CGM, you get billed for outcomes, um, and then we could slip it in because we don't have to get it covered. But technically, anyone here who is working in a health system, you have access to every single tool that any of us are using. 
the question is how do you deploy it, do you dedicate resources to it, and, and how do you um, get it to your patients? Yeah, I want to come back to finish the CGM question, but one of the questions that came up for you particularly, Josh, was how do you get this covered? How, mm -hmm. What is your business model? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it's we'll just take question. a side detour, let Josh answer that, and then yeah. we'll come back. So, um, so we offer a couple different business models, but the key one is we sell on outcomes. So we, when we sell to an employer or a payer, and now even a couple health systems, um, we ha the, the skin that we have in the game is if you have a financial benefit in taking somebody's A1C that's high, getting it low, keeping them out of an ER inpatient stay, or keeping them out of brick and mortar endocrinology, um, we have a model for that. And we, we are an in-network provider, so um, we have an actual medical clinic, we have an NPI number, so we could bill through a health plan. Um, the majority of contracts we have, though, there's an annual fee, basically like a membership fee, that we get paid, and then we have to return the money if we don't drive through the outcomes. And by doing that, we're able to move away from fee-for-service, which kind of gives us the wrong incentive, because it incentivizes us to do more, not necessarily um, do more effectively. Um, so, so that's how we work. We also have an interesting model, and I believe this is the future, but you have companies like ours that integrate back with healthcare or the primary care doc um, or the health system, but at the end of the day, we're, we're kind of this separate Coumadin clinic-like model. We really believe that um, we should become a service provider so that any primary care doc could you know, refer a patient to Onduo. They should get paid um, as if it's part of their <laughs> clinic, and then we almost become software service. Um, with some of the coaches and other things. Um, investing in you know, a coaching team and a bunch of CDs is not an inexpensive ordeal. One primary care doctor's office, usually it doesn't make sense. There's no way. Exactly, yeah. but yeah. this way we aggregate the primary care clinics virtually. Um, so it's like when you go to your dentist, if you need a root canal, usually they don't have an endodontist that works in the clinic. They come in on Wednesdays. We want to be able to do that for all primary care clinics. You talk about um, broader adoption of CGM. Yeah. It, glucose is one input for people on insulin, not on pumps. We don't have ways of capturing insulin data yet right. into the system. Yeah. So I think a key part for those on insulin therapy is being able to bring that information mm -hmm. into the system as well. So we're starting to see cusp with those. Many teams are working on it, including our team in Cambridge. Michael, I know you've got a team working on it. So I think that will be a key next step is to be able to bring that insulin data in as well as other contextual data that we can get depending on what users are willing to give us as far as meals and, and exercise and other important elements of the system. So I've learned a lot from my colleague, Stephen Russell, who is one of the people who's working on the bionic pancreas with um, Boston University. And the thing that's unique about their system is they have insulin and glucagon. And what I would say is that very, many, many automated insulin delivery systems work. And the reason they work is because once you have the CGM data, you're dosing, you're making an insulin, a decision about how much insulin to dose every five minutes. And it's a small dose. So if you guess wrong, five minutes, then five minutes later, you can correct. You can, if you overdose the first one, then you cannot dose the next five minutes, and so on and so forth. And so instead of having one insulin dose that you're committed to, the insulin can go on, it can go off, it can go on, 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 off. And that's why pretty much any automated pump, including the ones people are hacking off the web, which is an active thing that goes on, several of my patients do that, they all sort of work. Mm -hmm. The challenge is when you do it wrong, Yeah. For people, for a lot of people with type 1, people with brittle diabetes, it's very hard to be rescued from that phenomenon, which is where a glucagon rescue comes in. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of people who don't want to wear pumps who don't need to wear pumps. And if there could be more support for insulin dosing mm -hmm. from, you know, from anyone from a, and we've had questions about people, you know, young people to very old people, you know, old people who really can't manage their insulin dosing, can't drop the dose, can't deliver the dose, can't make a decision about a dose. It's, it's a very dangerous situation. So maybe you guys could comment on how um, having this is going to help with insulin dosing in the less intensive insulin user. I don't know, Michael, if, you, if that's something you guys are working on. Or... At a high level, I mean, it's public knowledge that we're working on a T2 pump, pump for T2 patients. That, that is a lot simpler, a lot less functionality, and, and a lot more ease of use. But uh, not necessarily in the sense of that you combine insulin and glucagon, but you only have insulin. So as a result, right, you're really just very, modulating. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think what yeah, needs to get to is like, how do you bring devices that people can understand, right? I, I find even when we look at our smartphones and so on, we have so much 
assumption that this is easy to use. And when you actually take human factors where you're behind a curtain, a one-way transparent window, and you have somebody train a user, an average Joe and an average Jane yeah. on the street, Absolutely. this is what you should do, then you do this, then you do this, and you see them a minute later not being able to take the three steps, it, it is a different world, right? I think what we're missing the largest is having the empathy for really how hard this is for people. And, and simple injections, simple keeping math is really hard for people, right? So I think in T1, we have so much focus, so much cost, so much time we can put into this, scaling it down to the T2 patient mm -hmm. segment that has a quite a different mentality, a quite a different mindset, mm -hmm. a technology openness, savviness that's at a different degree, and all their challenges in life because life goes on. This is just on the side. It should be primary, but it's really on the side and it's a struggle to keep along. It is really hard. And even a Bluetooth versus an NFC, I believe the Abbott Libra is so cool. I said that three years ago, it's probably the coolest minimal viable product in this market segment. Mm -hmm. Damn simple, no bricking, and the swiping actually forces me to be intentional. That's right. Yeah, a Bluetooth device is dumb somewhere else and I don't learn. And they've really done something where it was so easy to put on, no Bluetooth pairing and so on, right? And, and I think we take so much for granted. Sometimes you get upset with your headset in your car not pairing, right? Right. That's even easy. And reality is like patients have a lot of really basic struggles and we get so fascinated by technology, not understanding that once you put it in people's hands, your bar of expectation needs to go down here because that's a struggle really, right? So designing the products and designing the solutions, you know, with the services, I think some people need a full-blown service. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a titration solution. I'm not trying to make advertisement because it's been an uphill battle doing technology in the pharma company to be quite honest and transparent, and, and, and Josh knows that as well. But you know, we have about a few thousand patients now in India and Mexico on the titration solution. Nobody's ever complained about manual data entry for BGM or, or insulin data. Nobody. Really? They're people really happy it. to put yeah. the two values in in really? the morning and the evening. So. Uh -huh. We've even had people in study coordinators tell us after four, four months when they took the app away that people fell into depression. Mm -hmm. People had real issues because the crutch that they had that told them twice a day what to do was gone. So yeah, I think the empathy of understanding how so, basic life really is, and I think starting in the middle of that pyramid, right, before we go down right, without insulin, right, right. there's so much opportunity, and I think connectivity, we're working on it and everything. Yeah. But now comes Bluetooth pairing. Now it's a reusable yeah. pen. It's a disposable pen. Every two weeks I have to pair. Now it doesn't work. Yeah. People get fatigued very quickly and they don't enroll, right? They, they drop out very yeah, rapidly. And I think that's well, our no, biggest right? obstacle. Apps and dropping out of apps is, we're now seeing that in the space right. of, of um, digital health too. And we've seen that in trials, like the pen cap uh, yeah. trials to, for, to understand insulin delivery. Um, if it's paired with an app, I, I think you see two things. You see one, an early dropout. People like, I don't want to deal with this. The, you have to put my password in again to this app. The second thing you see is, where they got used to it and they really liked it and then it was gone because it was part of a study. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. It means that, right. that, that yeah, they can right. engage with this. And so I, I think we, knew, we do, I would love to understand which patients are going to engage. Um, I'll just make one other point, which is engaging patients. I think that's the elephant in the room because all of this requires a good amount of engagement. And we have, I have programs designed to capture patients who end up in the emergency room who just, with despite like 10 calls per month to their house, yeah. they just don't want to do it or they, they can't. They work nights, then they take care of their kids in their day. They're not important until yeah. their blood sugar is 500 and they feel yeah. awful. Yeah. So we're trying to get those people out of the ER just into the clinic. Um, and you know, then, then there are other you know, programs that we launch on patients who clearly are not doing well, but they're not picking up the phone. Yeah. They won't, and texting needs to be what we do because that's what people yeah. do now, but, but the phone is still more secure. Yeah, yeah I mean, one of, one of the things though, it's, it's funny, we talk about engagement. Um, one of the reasons why we have Google as our partner and why they're building the majority of our software is that we've specifically said, don't create a healthcare solution from healthcare professionals that we can then deploy out. We have to build something that the consumer will want to use. Um, so when Michael mentioned that you know they're willing to enter their blood glucose manually, that's 100% true as long as you give them back something in return yeah, that they find true. valuable. 
So there's like, I think there's like a thousand apps out there for logging your glucose. There's no value in just logging your glucose. It's actually a lot easier to write it on scraps of paper like the majority of people do. But if you, ma if you manually enter your blood glucose and it takes away two things, the mental calculation of how much insulin do I have to take and the stress of did I just screw up that calculation, that's value. Um, and so we have to keep looking at what's the user value that we could drive, and all of our solutions have to do that. When we do that, engagement goes really high because it's not engagement just for you know metric sake. It's engagement because the person's saying, "I want something that you could give me. How do I get it?" Yeah. Um, but but until we develop those things, we're just building fancier logging apps and. Yeah. things that we want them to do, but they don't want to do it. We all use that term engagement. I heard Glenn Tolman, at, at the, he runs Livongo, was the CEO there, and he once said, is it really engagement or is it empowerment? And I thought it was a, a great sort of shift because right. none of us want more time with diabetes, really, right? <laughs> and so when you say engagement, I'm like, I don't want 34% increased time no. on my phone. No. I actually want it to go away, right? right. So. I think that empowerment and Josh, you talking about the intermittent use of these technologies, how awesome would it be if I got to the point as a type one that I didn't feel that it was life or death right. without my CGM, right? Sure. I would love that day that I'm like, I'm so. not gonna put it on. So I think there's an element of trying to learn. We talk about behaviors and, and I always like to differentiate behavior from what the factor is influencing the behavior. So if the behavior is I'm not taking my insulin dose, and we're going to have some data coming out. We talk a lot about adherence more in the type 2 side, I think, than type 1. Some of the stuff we're seeing is it's no different, yeah. right? It's, and yeah. so very, it's, very you're starting to see that it's the factors that influence why I don't take my dose. Right. Big one, fear of hypoglycemia, right? Yeah. I'm not going to take my dose because I'm sitting on a panel and I'm not going to want to go low <laughs> and beep in front of all of you, right? So I'm going to ride high for a little bit. So those things are real in life and and so trying to figure out those factors how do we learn how do we yeah. take that and say okay marie you know these are the times we are not going to beep at you or various things so i think that empowerment is going to be really important for all of us i, I think we're, again you talk about where we are in this journey that's where i think we're at the very beginning is getting all this data in and learning about what are those factors that, you know, someone talked about weather apps. Like I use a weather app. I'm not there along, but I use it every single day because I want to know what the weather is. I'd like a diabetes app that does that as well. So gives you the weather and we can build that. Yeah, that's been done. That's been done. Not yeah. novel. Yeah. Not innovative. But, um, but, um, but what's interesting though, and this, this is what makes it really complex. So when we first started, um, the, now the Verily Google team has a lot of healthcare people, but in the beginning it was like guys that built like Angry Birds and stuff like that. And we started doing focus groups and it's a really hard space, especially in the type two space, because when we would do these focus groups, the number we'd say, okay, Google's gonna build the magic app, what do you want it to do? Everyone says, I, I don't want diabetes. Right, right. right. Like, That's make right. it so I don't have diabetes. Right. We're like, okay, no. but we need you to want to use the app. Right. What could we do? They're like, right. well, let me think less about my diabetes. Right. And so you, ha you have this user group that wants to spend as little time managing their disease mm -hmm. as possible, and yet you're trying to build stuff that gets used as much as needed. And so if you build for engagement, I think you're gonna fail. Instead, you have to build for impact and say, yeah. what's the, we, like we literally talk about what's the minimal amount of use we need to get to get maximum amount of impact, which for some people it's here, wear the CGM for 10 days, we'll give you a report during it or at the end of it, and then you're done for the next two or three yeah. months, and then we'll Although, come back. Yeah, I mean, realistically, and I know you know this, um, and I'm gonna, we're gonna shift gears in a little bit to talk about behavioral interventions for diabetes, because a lot of it is yeah. really getting the foundation. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, before we leave this glucose topic, I wanna do a couple of rapid fire questions that came in on glucose monitoring that this team um, may or may not know the answers to, because this is not our space, but mm -hmm. Um, one question was, does anyone have an update on uh, measuring blood sugar through the contact lens that was working, yeah. or sweat, or ear? Where does that stand? And how, how are all of these non-invasive devices coming along? I don't know the answer. So we'll see if um, these guys yeah. can, can tell us. Yeah. Google it. There was yeah, an article dead. two months ago. It, it was dead. stopped, basically, so, yeah. Yeah. calibration issues yeah. and, and correlation issues. And wearing contact lenses is so... Um, Oh, yeah, it's, and they kind of hurt. Uh, no, um, <laughs> this is, I think there's an article about it. I, I just think that you know it was a little ahead of its time. And accuracy counts for a lot. Yeah, I mean we can tell you because we've but seen CGMs I, evolve. Inaccurate CGMs, people just yeah. But I will like away. it's definitely. An, I'd probably get a 
minimum a call a month about some new non-invasive. Um, the ones that are sweat-based, urine-based, contact lens-based, they probably, like they've been doing these for 30, 40 years and nobody's figured out. There's this new one of minimally invasive. And I think the minimally invasive may get there. They use micro needles, so it's technically invasive, but technically not. Those ones have hope. Um, but we, we've yet to seen it uh, happen yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, and someone asked a question about completely non-invasive glucose monitoring through the Apple Watch. That you know, the, there mm. are devices now that go to the Apple Watch, but you do have to wear the sensor. I don't know if you guys have other comments. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, uh, d that brings up this issue that there's a um, sort of lore that gets built up around what, what we can do to monitor glucose. Um, and how easy certain things are. So there is an implantable device now, which you can wear for three months. Uh, the, what, oh, they had a lot of patients who are interested in it, and I know the bionic pancreas people are interested in just understanding if that's helpful. But it's still a device that sits on your arm and you can see it. You know, there are patients who thought it was invisible, which I think is another thing, going back to what patients want. They would love it to be invisible. I don't know if anybody saw that photo. You can Google uh, Theresa May with her Libre, yes. shaking hands with uh, Donald Trump. And then on the other arm, you can see where the adhesive was in her last uh, mm -hmm. site. But a lot of people don't want that. They, and, um, and so we haven't figured that out. The transmitter has to be sitting on the yeah. skin. This, so this one, just to explain this one, it's interesting. It's a company called Sensionic. You get a surgically implanted sensor but then you have to wear this device over it. The reason why they, the people love it though, apparently, <laughs> yeah. is they could shower and just take it off while right. they shower, go for a swim and take it off. And this concept, and Marie, you feel free to comment mm -hmm. on this, like if you haven't worn a CGM, like, it, it, like after a week or two, you feel like you're kind of chained to stuff. And there's mm -hmm. just, there's this like innate, like I don't want to be on this stuff all the time. Exactly. So having these things that you know are portable, you can take them on and off. I think is, like, I think there's a, there, there's just some psychology to yeah. being tethered. I think it goes back to choice, right? There's some people who that will be important. There's others who say I don't want to go in every three months yeah. and get it explanted and implanted. Yeah. So I, I do think that we'll see a, a number of these different types of technologies. Hoping I think the next phase miniaturization. So if we could even take the ones that we've got now and see them getting smaller and smaller, more like we all talk about if I could just have my, you know, tattoo or, or band-aid on instead of what we've got right now, which is a, you know, a durable transmitter that sits on your stomach for long periods weeks, of time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If, if we're lucky. They don't, as Josh said, for any of us who, who exercise, you're, uh, that can be a challenge. <laughs> So let me turn now, there was a question about how can we use technology to monitor for complications. And so I want to kind of think about not just, sometimes I feel in diabetes we can be a little glucose centric. Mm -hmm. um, I think particularly since CGMs have come online, everybody really wants to make use of this really cool new technology. But certainly for type 2 diabetes, that's not necessarily, in my view, where the money is. Um, it's really in complications. So how do we see these things evolving either remotely or in other ways to kind of monitor and intervene to prevent yeah. complications of diabetes? So I, I guess, I mean, it depends. So we have um, partnered with a couple of foot companies that use different um, either insoles or other things to predict if somebody's developing a foot ulcer. So that's a really expensive, I think, thirty to $40,000 a year event that has a 70% reoccurrence. So if you could capture people who, who have these, you could then you know, prevent it. So that, like, that's one thing that, that we've partnered with. We think that's really important. Um, m even just monitoring glucose when you can is still critical. And then um, there's a, we're doing, a, Verily is doing a lot of work on retinopathy. So not enough people are getting their retina screening. Mm -hmm. So can we basically increase access to that or democratize that? Yeah, you can easily imagine a phone just. Yeah. Right. Well, there, actually, there's, um, there is a device that they're, that the, that's in development that where you can take a, a retinal photo from a, a phone. Mm. But um, so what I was going to say is there is this other level, which is glycemia is connected to cardiac function and can actually, they can predict each other. So um, heart rate variability is a predictor of low blood glucose and probably vice versa. But more importantly, if you do have low blood glucose, it, you're, uh, you're at risk of a cardiac event depending on your age. Mm -hmm. So I, I do see there's, you, you see that bubbling up a little bit where heart rate monitors and glucose monitors might be synced up to, 
to predict um, cardiovascular events, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and that could be you know all boil all uh, uh, connected in one kind of ha app for a patient mm -hmm. with with advancing diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say you know there's other com the other complications we worry about is, is the kidney, which I don't see I don't see a real application there, but. <laughs> I'm sure if we wait a few years, we'll, we'll be there. We'll right. be and, you know, and I guess the other thing that pops to mind is weight self-monitoring and yeah. sort of digital scales oh, sure. and yeah. kind of lifestyle intervention for diet, exercise, and weight loss. I don't know if you guys want to comment on anything that's happening in your spaces yeah. for that. I think on the insulin delivery side, it's going to be important for the algorithms to get smarter over time because those who have renal dysfunction or risk of cardiovascular Absolutely. event, That's you may point. not want to be as tight on glucose you measurement. Adjust. You, to you want to adjust because their risk of hypo could result in a, in a cardiovascular event. Or if you've got someone who's in their 70s and still living at home and living on their own, you know, so I think the ability to really personalize the algorithms so they're not just rule-based, but they're... Um, take into account those complications is another area that we'll start to see evolve over the coming years. They call it heuristic algorithms that learn people over time. I think there's a lot of technology that can exactly address what's there. I think all of these technologies are early. Yeah. yeah. You know, making people to step, yeah. how well does it go with a weight scale every morning? Yeah, Even yeah right, right, right. People, right. the more you put technology in, while we can do it, can we have to be back. careful about how much we yeah. deploy because yeah. it turns people off. It, it, it's, it's amazing to see when people have to do it every day, mm -hmm. how very quickly things become a mm -hmm. yeah. turn off. And once you turn off, you turn off. Getting them back is really, really hard. Yeah. It's a figuring out how. I think it's interesting just to mm -hmm. share one thought, right? Completely non-technology. We had invested many years ago in the joint venture in, in, in Asia and India and expanding called the Sugar Clinics. So it's really small little sugar clinics, very small or mid-size or larger size. They do nothing else but do exactly offer food education, do food exams, do eye exams and so on because that stuff's not available. So I think yeah. you know, if you could do more with your smartphone, you can actually take a picture every three months and that could become di diagnostically relevant. That might put it into people's hands and become valuable. I'm not sure every day, every mm -hmm. multiple times, right. but that's going to get adopted. We, we've, we've taken a slightly different approach. So there's some people that will step on the scale every day. They'll use their glucose meter every day, and, yep. and we embrace those people. The others, they, the majority won't. Right. And so what we've done is we kind of took an analogy from going to your dentist. So when you schedule your dentist appointment, people start brushing and flossing, like at least twice a day and flossing mm -hmm. once a day in the couple weeks leading up to their appointment. So we've kind of leveraged that same thing. We find out when your, next doc when your next doctor's appointment is, and we start engaging you in the weeks leading up mm -hmm. to your appointment. So you walk in with a tight logbook and, and your, your, you know, whatever behavior things you were supposed to be doing that you've been doing. And we find that actually is pretty effective. Mm -hmm. um, we call it the toothbrush exam. Um, but, but you have to find, like, what are those human latch points to engage them? Because, like, the one thing I promise you mm -hmm. is unless it's life or death and they have to do it, trying to engage somebody across mm -hmm. the year, it's just never going to happen. I think this is a good point because there are, I, I call these sort of patient subtypes that, that, <laughs> that they're, they, you can predict that what level they're, they'll engage um, after meeting them a few times. And, and one patient population we haven't talked about are those who don't care about their right. blood sugar. Mm -hmm. They have no... Or anything else. What they want is, is they like... Say they like their, their doctor, is an example that maybe we have experienced. <laughs> they want you to smile. Or maybe they want their kid to be happy with them. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. they don't mm -hmm. really care what goes into that, but they want to, they'll do what needs to be done. Yeah. So there has to be, in the, for those patients, some kind of a positive feedback to them that they're on track Mm -hmm. to better health and that maybe is shared with their family or this approach where it's just about showing up to the doctor yeah. with the right and getting a good grade, maybe that in a lifetime really has a huge impact on their yeah. overall glycemia, yeah. you know? I, yeah, I, I agree and we, we look at the same type of genotypes, but the, the one thing that for some reason all these digital companies forget is like basic health economics that 10 or 15 percent of the dri population drives 60 percent of the cost. Yes. And so, like, I look at all our competitors who are just BGM companies, and oh, BGM and lifestyle coaching, that's great, but you're going to get the people with A1Cs of seven who want to use their BGM and lifestyle coaching. Exactly. If you yeah. can't get to the 10 or 15 percent who are lifestyle resistant or more complex, like, you, no you're point. just yeah. a wellness app. Yeah. 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 
So one of the questions that came in is what about um, including food um, monitoring of food or carb calculations, which might be helpful for future insulin delivery systems. But in general, how can we use technology to help us make better food choices in this toxic food environment? Um, I'll just, you know, I, I don't know the great, a good, excellent answer to this, but I do think food logs that, cor that are linked to the insulin dose and what happens to the glucose are, can be very valuable. They have to be done in, in a smart way and patients will only engage for short periods of time if it requires them to enter data. Um, but I, I have seen, you know, the, the um, you know, uh, apps that where you can take a picture of your plate and this would probably be, for, again, for just two weeks at a time. And it would link to your insulin dose. And that can be sort of analyzed by your clinicians or just by the computer itself, you know, analyzing sure. the carb cont yeah. content, protein content. That's been done relatively well uh, by a couple of programs. Um, and patients can learn that way probably better than if they just had to count the carbs in their plate um, yeah. themselves. It's probably the next barrier, right, as you have glucose. And you understand that, then the next question is like, well, where I have exceptions, what's the next yeah. factor? It's workout, it's food, right? So yeah. I think it, it feels like the next barrier. I, I think getting people to, and you guys can chime in, getting people to count, count is almost impossible, impossible yeah. right? So I think the reality is like, how do you get something in that's like pictures, right? And maybe even, yeah. again, what's the context, right? Either the patient sees the context now and makes a decision and understands, or the context is there that when I go to the physician next yeah. time, the physician can see there was a drop or whatever, an increase, and they see, oh, that's why, and now you can have a smarter dialogue, right? Algorithms at some point probably, but intermittently maybe start with improving the dialogue at the right yeah, time. Right. The, the food thing, so we've looked at a lot of digital health companies that do food. Um, the, the, the best, most accurate one actually has a team in the Philippines that is looking at every single picture, <laughs> and they're, they're writing in what it is and giving it a no food idea. score. Yeah, so, so, so cause yeah. if you think wow. about it, um, so we, we our, our app has, you take a picture and it goes to the cloud and it looks at all the Google, Google photos, and if you take a picture of a steak and someone else tagged a steak, it'll say this is a steak. The problem is though, is unless you have a set, like a ruler, on the plate, the AI can't tell A, how big it is, and a camera can't pick out, so I could have mashed potatoes this high, and it says, you know, that's two servings of mashed potatoes. So it, it can't perfect it. We then use it um, for the, kind of the bluntest form, which is if you're wearing a CGM or doing paired checking, we could say a steak increases you by 40, right? And in so general. we, yeah, we give it contextual. Um, in, we, again, we've looked at a lot in the ideal world. You'll almost, for those of you who have Google on your phone, there's a thing called Google um, Capture, where if you click that little photo button on Google, you could actually point your camera at Nelson, and if it recognized Nelson, it'll say, this is Nelson. Um, that's what we want to get to, where you could actually literally live time scan food, and it will say, this is 1,000 you know, uh, calories and it's, you know, 90 grams of carbs and it's going to result in an 800 glucose <laughs> and you have three choices. Don't eat it, eat half of it, or take this much insulin yeah. or meds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I would agree with all those. I think food's a, a tough one. I think carb counting in general is tough. And, and Dr. Wolpert, who's, who's at our center, I keep thinking of his pizza study, right? So yeah. it's not just all about the carbohydrates. It's about the fat. Okay. It's about the protein, right? So the, the pizza study is, is that you eat the pizza, you don't get high till four hours later because the fat content delays when you have your glucose rise afterwards. So again, we can teach people and engage them on carb counting, and they're just going to get frustrated in many ways when the first time they do it, it doesn't match, and they did the math, or the app did the math right. So it goes back to what we can do today versus where we can probably be in the future. You do know, and all of us, we all have habits, right? And so little things like, Marie, Mondays are a bad day for you. If you look at mine, Mondays are always a bad day for me because I run around all Monday. weekend. <laughs> for all of us, for our worst day, right? Because you run around all weekend and then you come and sit like this all day, yeah. right? So your body naturally, it takes me a heck of a lot more insulin on Monday than it does any other day of the yeah. week. Yeah. How many people know that or right. have so that? Let me, let me bring this so, back to AI because yeah. we have yeah. a frustrated questioner who wants to know where is AI and all of this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so, and, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so, I don't know. I thought Nelson was a table. So, and that's Google at its best. Um, yeah, it's funny. I mean, 
if you guys go to Silicon, if you take any pitch, all you're gonna hear is cognitive computing, AI, machine learning, and it's and then in the end, it's somebody in the Philippines looking at a picture and, and putting yeah. something in. You know, there's there, we've been using rule based you know guidelines for decades. So so everyone wants to chase AI. I don't think AI is a silver bullet for anything. I, I think we should just be looking at um, automation and then say where where's automation replacing what used to be heuristic algorithms mm -hmm. um, and getting smarter. Right. Um, I, I think just chasing AI for AI's sake in healthcare is great for conferences, but it's, it's not great for actual. Yeah, let me, I'm going to pick up on that and even though I'm the moderator, jump in because there was another question about closed loop and exercise. There was another question about closed loop and, um, you know, decision making. And I do just want to come back to this point about the closed loop system that also uses gl glucagon because at a little bit side, it's automation, but it's not really AI, AI and it sidesteps right. all yeah. of this. Mm -hmm. Really all it's asking the patient to do is wear the device. The insulin can be delivered aggressively by the algorithm because there's glucagon, which is the hormone, of course, that the body normally would use to raise blood glucose. And it really is as if you're driving, you know, right now with diabetes, you're driving a car yes. without a brake. But as soon as you have the glucagon, you've got the gas and the brake. And it's pretty simple, actually, if you can get the new formulation of glucagon to work, if you can get the pump to work, if you can get the devices to work. It's costly. It's cumbersome to make it work right now. But fundamentally, that really sidesteps all of this, and I think speaks mm. to what Josh was just saying. To the question about exercise, um, once you've given insulin, if somebody starts to walk across Copley Square briskly, the blood sugar will drop, and there's not a lot you can do about that right now except to take some glucose. But if you had a device that could give you a squirt of glucagon to bring it up, you know, you'd be good to go. Mm -hmm. And that is not really AI. It's really just simple if you have the right tools. Right. Other thoughts about AI? Sorry, I guess that's why moderators aren't supposed to chime in because then it No, it's good. <laughs> but, I think it but does I, sum I, it up. Um, and I, I also think for clinicians, um, I, I think the communication around where AI fits in healthcare needs to be a little bit dumbed down just because, it, like you just you said it so nicely, you know, it's re we're not really talking about AI. We're talking about really finely tuned algorithms that have a... Feedback, feedback loop. Yeah, so which is just, not necessarily AI, which yeah. changes over time. You know, you you get you basically the system learns, and then changes in yeah. a loop. That's not really where we are. Yeah, right? I, I spoke. So I, somebody gave me the best analogy. So the head of Google Brain or Google, the, the guy who runs AI for Google, basically said, as sophisticated as AI is today, like they were trying to say, what could AI work on? They said wake up an expert in the middle of the night and within five seconds, three or five seconds, if they could tell you what it is, AI could get that sophisticated. <laughs> could. Could, yeah, so could. So like, so the example is an EKG. You wake up a cardiologist in the middle of the night, say, what's this? They could tell you, you know, it's, it's, it's non-sustained VTAC. And sure enough, if you look at, you know, an EKG at the top of an EKG, and this has been happening for probably okay. a decade, yeah. There's a reading, right? More and they, they, and they yeah. teach you to cover it before yeah. you interpret it. But it's it. always right. But it's, always, it's usually right. <laughs> so that's, that's where I think AI could get to. So if it's, mm -hmm. if it's look at a CGM and what's the best day, what mm -hmm. things spike, the, the AI could do that. Yeah. But when you layer in exercise and mood and mm -hmm. menstrual cycle and time, like, that's when it starts to get. Yeah. So that's on an complex. individual letter, le level. Sorry. One place where I have seen AI, and I've seen a lot of papers in the literature about AI, is could we use big data from electronic health records to help doctors make better choices about which glucose lowering medication For to prescribe sure. or which mm -hmm. blood pressure For medication? Sure. Could we look at similar patients based on all of the characteristics, which might or might not be the characteristics that I, as a person thinking about it, would evaluate, but all yeah. the data that's out there, could that feed into a decision about? medication choice and would that improve our system? So let's, let's talk about that prospect in AI. Yeah, I think um, I agree with you that uh, you know, there are nice studies pooling data from multiple clinical trials using different drugs that, that have, you know, even though the trial may have found that um, drug A was better than drug B, when you pool different characteristics, you can say, oh, actually, if you happen to be 55 to 65 and your, your kidney function mm -hmm. is lower, this, this drug was better. So we, we have the data. and. I think electronic health systems are um, primed for this. You know, Epic, for example, which is everywhere now, um, they, it's always telling me what, what's going on. It's not using AI yet, as far as I know, maybe a little bit. 
but but yeah, I, I think it would make sense. You know, you're these little uh, they're called um, clinical decision mm -hmm. support. support. Yeah. yeah, these little pop ups that come up, and th there's a little issue with pop up fatigue as we talk about, mm -hmm. where doctors just click them away because they just get in the way of what you're trying to do. But if they're useful and maybe color coded for like this is really a medication recommendation, I, I think it would be a, a huge boon for primary care physicians. Yeah. I think that space has a lot of opportunity, and you, you yeah. brought up the keyword decision support, right? I hope yeah. it's not pop-up, because then I yeah. would have so much, but when a patient comes in yeah. and I have a decision, what do I want to do, and based on the ZGM data and something else that says, hey, a patient like this is probably prone to better be off with this, yeah. you're not really making the call, because getting through a clinical trial, even though the FDA's recent AI announcement is great, we're not there yet, right? And, and saying, how is that safe and effective and never wrong? That's really the problem to Could prove. Could you say a few words about the FDA's AI announcement? Or just, what do you, what do you mean? Well, <laughs> I don't mean to. Yeah, at, at a high level, yeah. I think they, they basically going now forward in a, how can we actually embrace AI and mm -hmm. how can actually the AI algorithm after approval basically still make changes? Mm -hmm. And how would that be okay? Because you get an approval at a time. Yes. Nothing right. stays still, yes. right? And it fits right. a little bit also in the software methodology, which is you can test as much as you want, but now you release and yep. you learn so much more in the field. Yep. How do you bring that back? Right. And, and that how is, is it challenge. okay to actually now change? Mm -hmm. yep. And that's kind of a dicey spot. Right. But Very I think it's challenge. good where they're going. But I like clinical decision support because even the last 20 years in radiology, that's really in pathology where it's going. You're nudging the physician. Here are your options. This seems to be more likely. And you're visualizing, alerting, and showing. They're still making the decision. But I think there's value in saying, hey, this patient's irregularity yeah. on following through on the EMR, by the way, based on their mm -hmm. records, we can tell they're not great at following through. Right. So maybe a premix is better than a multiple daily injections. Right. Those so, are things that yeah, I think yeah. an algorithm, an algorithm, AI is much more sophisticated. Yeah. A basic algorithm can pick up and you can get validated and then really you're nudging. And I think we can also think about AI or algorithms in the sense of nudging the patient again, right? What are the, mm -hmm. they need to make decisions every day. The physician makes a decision at every point when they meet the patient. That's very rare, right? It's not that often. How do we do that decision support life? Yeah, I'll add two thoughts to it. One is um, when I ran retail clinics, or t I ran Target's clinics, and we had algorithm-based care, right? You came in with the ear infection, you do this, do this, and if the diagnosis is otitis media, our electronic medical record would say, here's your first line, here's your second line. If they have an antibiotic allergy to penicillin, here's what you do. And our nurse practitioners revolted. And like I remember, we had like basically like you know an uprising saying, We're, "This is cookbook medicine. We don't want cookbook medicine." And it takes a cultural shift um, for a health system to be able to say, like, your job's to make the diagnosis. You're not running the clinical trials. There's too much data out there for you to actually choose what the medicine is. Our job as healthcare providers is to build the relationship, rule out the bad stuff, make a diagnosis, and then follow algorithm-based care. Um, so the first one is, it sounds easy to say, but yeah. then to get doctors to actually accept it is really hard because, of course, we know better. Um, but then the second one is just the, the, the richness of an EMR. Like, as a practicing ER doc, I would look at a patient in front of me in the EMR, and I could see their labs. Maybe I'd look at the last couple sodiums, but the EMR knows what the last five years of sodiums are. It knows what the sodiums are of everyone else in the ER that day, of everyone in the hospital, et cetera. And it could start picking up things like Michael was saying that I would never even have imagined. Like, mm -hmm. hey, they skipped three out of the last 10 appointments. That then predicates how we should treat them next. And so I don't think we see a lot of this yet, but if they could figure out how to start mining the EMR right. for these, this type of clinical decision support, I mean, that's, I think, the next um, frontier of yeah. healthcare. Agree. Yeah. Agree with all the other comments. I, don't, you know, I guess the only other question is you need good data to start to build these systems, right? I keep coming back to the same okay. point. Okay. So, you know, CGM, as we talked about, even though we keep saying it's new, it's been out since 2006, I think, mm -hmm. some of those earlier versions. So. Healthcare has typically been fairly slow on these, you know, adoption, and we're just starting to see the cusp on, on glucose sensing. We've got other types of analytes we need to sense, and I think we're starting the period. Josh, you're right, we can combine that 
with EMR data, but I think the EMR data alone still isn't going to tell you why right. the patient isn't showing up, right, or why they're not taking their insulin dose. You've got to figure out those motivators, what's causing them, and we just don't have the input yet. So I think the first job is to be able to provide tools to help capture that data, make what impact we can today on outcomes, and then continue to learn and grow and, and see those outcomes improve over time building in AI. I think the population and care management aspects will be where it will be most relevant. You know, we talk about carb counting. Most physicians is, don't use carb counting, especially with type twos, right? They use fixed doses. Every lunch, take 10, 10 units, right? Or take five units, or they'll use meal size. If it's a large meal or your normal meal, use this, right? What if we could actually take all that data coming in and start to look at it and say, which of those is better and what type of patient does well? So again, capture the data and then we can move into the period of AI. So yeah, we're just in our last few moments. So if people have last questions they want to submit, put them in now. And I want our moderators to think about whether they have any um, kind of closing remarks um, before we sum up. There was one um, quick question I wanted to, to ask and that was about, uh, so I want to give our moderators a chance to think while I'm um, speakers a chance to think while we're asking, and that is any contact or experience with the open app community. And I think what this question means, correct me, is the people who are using sort of um, open app software to control a pump. Is that what you meant? Is that whoever asked that? I do have a couple of patients. Is that what you meant? People who are using open app, like? Yeah. So I do have a couple of patients, just to answer that specific question, who, and what this is, is there is, open app software on the web, people hack an old Medtronic pump with a CGM to a little um, kind of control board, and it actually requires a fair bit of technical sophistication to do it. You don't have to be a computer scientist, but you do have to really be able to follow a complex set of instructions and then troubleshoot it. The only thing that that really does is it controls the basal rate. It's an automatically adjusting basal rate, which is commercially available in many systems on the market. And I, I don't really have a problem with the patients who've chosen to do it. They tend to be very sophisticated, very tech savvy people. I don't see that it offers that much more than what's kind of commercially out there, in my opinion. I don't know whether your patient's using it. Yeah, I have one, actually. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, this comes up every year at the American Diabetes Association, and people spend an hour talking about this because the issue is who's taking care of the patient if the if the device is not FDA cleared you know are you supporting that use it so that stuff is out there but I think the patients will say listen you guys are too slow and I see so with with bringing this stuff to the market so we need to hack into these systems to make them better for us but I say to them you know there's a reason why they're slow I mean, we really didn't have real-time I say it again we didn't have real-time CGM data Till just the past couple of years, really th three or four years, but the G5 and G6 Dexcom and now the Libre, they, they're pretty revolutionary. I, yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah, but so I would, the there's something worth pausing for on this one. Yeah. So for, this blows my mind. It's mostly parents, and they literally get together where they're saw, you know, what do you saw, 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 soldering, 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 yeah. yeah. soldering, yeah. 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 and then yeah. they they put the board into the device for their kids. And so it kind of shows two things. One is to what lengths people will go. Yeah. Um, but then it also shows the other side, like, like seriously? Like, you could go on the web and buy these chips and then put it in. Yeah. And it's like homemade pumps, which is kind of scary. Um, uh, but it yeah. really does show, how, like, how passionate this community yeah. is. I'm especially mostly in Yeah, and I might not, I mean, uh, passion's one thing to be able to sleep through the night it's because wild. your sugars are flat when you're on the loop is another yeah. thing. So they're, right, for yeah. some people, they've it's, been life changing. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And it's, they're not soldering in wild. the pump. They do it on the side and they keep it in a tic tac box, you know, so it's all up and up it's on the, uh, that side. Box, so yeah. um, the good <laughs> news is, is um, the good news is, is there's a study underway. So you can look, it's, it's the loop, and I believe. Um, there's two organizations that are funding a study. So hopefully those individuals who have really been um, ahead of the game will ultimately see that product get the approval that we yeah. all want it to get. So yeah, there yeah, are some efforts happening. underway yeah. there. So we have a rapid fire. People seconds. have last thoughts they want to leave us with really quickly. So my last, you and I have worked on patient reported outcomes before. Yeah. I think that we could capture a lot of the patient subtypes by Question, giving questionnaires to patients when they enter the, the healthcare system about what they want, you know, what they need, 
um, and this is easily done with electronic health records, iPad in the waiting room. And from there, I think we could, we could inform a lot of these systems in diabetes, what, what would work for the individual patient. We need to get there. Other quick last thoughts? Or do you it's a workflow problem. <laughs> it's not a technology problem. It's a workflow, and it's humans and physicians and patients involved in getting that all in their hands and, and working at scale is a challenge. And, uh, but I think the, the data is an enabler. In the last few years, we've seen really a big opening of data that can enlighten people. It opens up the avenue going forward for innovation that we haven't seen in the last 10 years, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd actually look at it from a slightly different view. So I, I worked for Target in 2007, and we had an option to buy Amazon for $2 billion. And, and uh, the leadership said, nah, we're brick and mortar. We, this is where everything is. 1% of retail sales are through digital. Um, and we all see where Amazon is today and where Target is. Um, partners like Onduo or others, if you are a brick and mortar health system, it's really easy to keep billing fee for service, to keep seeing patients. Um, but for every day that Undo exists, five competitors of mine pop up, and, and more and more and more consumers are starting to use us. So to either build it yourself, to partner with somebody, um, but don't be Target in 2007 having a chance to buy <laughs> Amazon for two billion. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll add, I had um, workflow down to maybe I'll add life flow, which goes with simplicity, right? We've all talked about it is we've got to meet people where they are, let them live their lives mm -hmm. and be as, uh, you know, least invasive as possible with these systems. I think it's really important. I think we have to expect to change and, and endorse change and um, work across all of our different groups to say what is going to be different now that we have technologies in place. And that's including the business models and, and what we do on that side as well, the integration of the products and the care systems. It's exciting time. I think, as I always say to people diagnosed today, it's uh, I never, I, you never want to say it's a good time, right? It's not a good time. Um, but I think it's yeah. a better time than it was. And I think hopefully over the coming years, we'll start to see some uh, real benefit and improvement in outcomes. Well Great. Well, I would really like yeah. to thank all of our panelists thank who you. were amazing and thank the World Medical Innovation Forum for having this forum today. Thank you all for thank coming. You.